I realize that in order for you to support this event, I need to kind of cast the vision about what's happening and what this event represents and why it's so important to be a part of what God is doing. I believe in Macosta County and in the surrounding areas. Uh, we're really praying for revival. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to move in that place. We signs and wonders following everything happening just like the old-fashioned tent revivals back in the day. So if you want to see miracles, if you want to see some of this thing, come on out because I believe in, we're believing for it. Amen? All right. Uh, so, and then God has, I put on there, uh, verse 3 there, uh, God has supernaturally orchestrated this event. It is amazing to me, and I'm going to just move away a little bit, how much this thing has come together. My sister started mowing her lawn. She's, she's got a farm, and she mows a lot of the acreage on the farm, and she's mowing this lawn, and she's like, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just drops this thought into her heart. This would be a great place for a tent revival. Now, you know that was the Holy Spirit. So then she goes to her pastor, and he's like, you're kidding. She he says, I've been wanting to do this to coincide with the Jonathan Kahn event that's coming up in September. And so then she contacted me, and I contacted my friend Laura Lyons. And Laura's like, you got to be kidding. She said, I just prayed. And <laughs> she goes, I just prayed and said to God, Lord, I am willing to step out in ministry again if you open the door, and I got your text, like the same day, right? And she's like, you're an answer to my prayers. And I'm like, no, we're seeing God just sort of put these chess pieces in place as he's getting ready to do this event. So I encourage you all to come out. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, well, Sunday, we should probably come here. But, <laughs> but, but Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, you know, make it out to, um, to the tent revival. So the return is basically it's a global day of prayer and fasting. It's going to be in the Washington, D.C. Uh, at the, the mall, the, the mall there. Um, you guys know who Jonathan Kahn is? He, he wrote The Harbinger. He wrote a few books. You know who he is? Yeah. Anyway, he just wrote a new book called The Harbinger 2, and it, he put in a lot of really kind of interesting facts. Uh, so anyways, that's the event. Uh, those dates... Are, that, that's at the 26th. Um, it's a ten, and there's 10 days of prayer, fasting, and repentance, starting with the biblical Feast of Trumpets and ending with the Day of Atonement. And those dates are September 18th through the 28th. Uh, and for more information, you have the website there. You can go on to the website. So um, <clears throat> how many of you guys love to like search out these kind of fun things like the Feast of Trumpets and just see how God uh, orchestrated these events in the Old Testament and see how Jesus kind of fits into these events. Isn't it fun to kind of see how God just does these things that nothing he does is coincidental. He has a purpose and a plan for all of it. Uh, so in order to understand that these days that we're talking about, what they represent, we need to go back and look at the historical account in the Bible of these feasts. But we'll, and we'll be concentrating specifically on the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so the biblical Feast of Trumpets, I got most of the information you're going to get in this section, I got from the Discovering the Jewish Jesus uh, thing that I watched on TV. But there are a few things that I added to this, because I'm like, if you want to know how Jesus fulfilled this feast, you got to go back to the people who know what this feast is about. You got to go to the Jews who celebrate this feast every year, who have been brought up on this, who know what they're talking about, right? And get some information. And so that's what I did. So uh, the Feast of Trumpets is associated with the future return of Jesus, the Messiah. Let's read the Levitical text about the Feast of Trumpets. And this is Leviticus 23. This is in the New King James Version. And it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, uh, excuse me, spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. 
You shall do no customary work on it, and sh you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So the New American Standard Version says it like this, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So in Hebrew, the day of blowing is called Yom Terah, day of trumpets, okay? In modern Hebrew, it's Rosh, which means head, and Hashanah, which means the year, so the head of the year, or the new year. This is the Jewish new year, but it means more to them than our standard, like, new year of what we celebrate, right? We have resolutions on our new year. We say, hey, we're going we're gonna to try to make this year better. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to establish this new resolution and I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we have all these resolutions. But it's not like that for the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture have Rosh Hashanah and then they have these 10 days that are between Rosh Hashanah called the 10 days of awe and in the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, is 10 days of repentance and reflection and prayer. 10 days dedicated to making sure they're right because they understand the next holiday, what's going to happen on Yom Kippur. So they're... I got off my notes. I'm going to go back a little bit. So the rabbinical mindset is that those 10 days called the Day of Awe are called that because Jewish people understand that on Yom Kippur, in 10 days from Yom Terah, God judges the world. Because on Yom Kippur, the blood of a bull and goat was brought into the Holy of Holies by the high priest of Israel, so the Jewish people understood the significance of the time between the blowing of the trumpet and the blood sacrifice offered on the mercy seat located on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. When the, law, when the Lord saw the blood poured out on the mercy seat, he would forgive the sins of Israel for their sin and tra transgressions against the Ten Commandments which were inside the Ark of the Covenant. All right, so the Lord uh, said in the book of Leviticus 17, 11, he said this, uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar, saith the Lord, uh, on the altar to make atonements for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. There was no other way. It had to come through the blood. So once again, as we take a step back, we're focusing on the Feast of Trumpets. But the Feast of Trumpets inaugurates the 10 days of awe leading up to Yom Kippur, that is the day that God forgives the sins of his people. But Israel understood that in order for their sins to be forgiven, they had to repent. They couldn't just assume that God would forgive them. They had to humble themselves before the Lord. This is why the Lord gave instructions in the Bible that on Yom Kippur, every soul must humble himself. And the soul that does not humble himself, the Lord said, he will cut off from his people. Uh, before I read that, I want to go back up to that first paragraph on page two, because I missed something there that I want to share. I'm sorry that I, I kind of, you probably read it in the middle of that passage on the second and that first paragraph on the second page, this was interesting to me. Uh, because according to Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, um, according to rabbinical tradition, it was on this day, the Day of Trumpets, that the Lord created the world. So Jewish people celebrate this day and incorporate it in their celebration is a concept that Rosh Hashanah or Yom Terah is the anniversary of mankind. So, now that's not in the Bible, that's rabbinical tradition, okay? They, they believe that it was during this time that God created the world. So they have this in their mind as they celebrate these days, okay? All right, now we'll go back down to 
<laughs> now we go back down to humbling yourself. All right, so Leviticus 23, 26, 29 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of the seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest. And you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month that evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. Now it's important to remember that the Jewish day begins in the evening. We begin our day at midnight. But they begin their day when the sun goes down. Okay? <clears throat> So you say, well, afflict your souls. That's kind of a weird kind of way to say it. But here's what the uh, New American Standard Version says of that. It says this, if there is any person who will not humble himself on this same day, he shall be cut off from my people. So afflicted your souls is the understanding of humbling yourself before a mighty God. Okay? So forgiveness, atonement through the shedding of blood, is not something that God just automatically does without man's participation. Man has to humble himself, put himself in a posture of being able to receive God's forgiveness by recognizing his sin and evil and bowing before his maker and saying, God, forgive, forgive me. And when he sees the blood that shed, in this case the animal that had to die, and later God himself clothed in the flesh that had to die, we re he realized, or we realize how hideous, how horrendous, and how serious evil and sin really are. We can understand that Yom Terah does not only get us ready for Yom Kippur, Yom Terah, the day of blowing, also known as Rosh Hashanah, is really ultimately about a reminder that the Creator is going to judge His creation. He's going to reveal Himself to the world. He's coming back. In Leviticus 23, 23 through 25, the children of Israel were to blow the trumpet, and the trumpet was to remind them, right? Verse 24 says, You shall... You shall have a rest, a reminder by the blowing of trumpets. So what's curious about this passage here is that we know we're supposed to blow the trumpet, and the trumpet is to be a reminder, but what is, what is it that the blowing of the trumpet would remind us of? The text doesn't tell us here, but when we look deeper into the Word of God, it brings us back to the book of Exodus chapter 19. What did that blowing of the trumpet remind Israel of? A bit of background, okay? I'll give you a little background if you don't know the story of Exodus 19. The children of Israel are now three months out of Egypt. They, they've gotten to the wilderness of Mount Sinai. They've been three months. They get to Mount Sinai, and here they've camped, right? So this is where our story picks up. Oh, no, first, sorry. At that process, at that time, then Moses goes up onto the mountain, and he's talking with God, and God says, hey, he says, I'm about to do something that I haven't done since Adam, right? He's like, I'm about to come down onto the mountain. You have three days to prepare the people, get them ready. They have three days to consecrate themselves because I'm coming down on the mountain, right? So here's where we pick up the story. So then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, that there were thunderings and lightning and a thick cloud on the mountain. So you know what that cloud is, the cloud that led them by day and night, right? That's the glory cloud. That's the atmosphere of heaven. It's descended on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain, 
Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. He hasn't even set foot yet. He's just about, he's on his way and the mountain is already shaken. Right? And the trumpet is blowing. This isn't a trumpet from a priest. This is a trumpet that's being blowed from heaven. Okay? This is a heavenly trumpet being blown onto the earth and the whole mountain is shaking and quaking because the God of the universe is about to set foot on the mountain. And then... And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now, can you imagine just a regular Israelite, <laughs> just a regular guy, in the camp when this event is taking place. Now these guys, they saw God part the Red Sea. They saw the Red Sea close down. But man, can you imagine standing on the ground when God himself shows up on the mountain? They were terrified. They were overwhelmed with the power of the Almighty So what is happening in this text? The whole mountain is covered in smoke and fire representing his glory. It is quaking under the very presence of, the, of God as the mountain is prepared for the God of the universe to come down upon it. I just said that. Okay. Uh, how? <laughs> and then what happens? A celestial trumpet starts blowing from heaven, and it's, loud, it's getting louder and louder. In verse 20, Moses speaks... The mountain, and God calls him up the mountain. Man, how assured is he in his relationship with the Almighty God that he is ready to climb the mountain when this event is happening in front of him? I mean, are we sure that we are ready when Jesus comes back? Are we going to be ready and so assured that we run toward the trumpet, that we run toward the sound of the archangel? as he's blowing the trumpet, as Jesus is coming in the air. And we that assured of our salvation that we are going to go out to meet the God of the universe as he's about to come back. That's, uh, that ought to excite you a little bit. That pretty much excites me, right? This is God Almighty coming in glory. So where am I at? Anybody? Okay. Just as God descended on Mount Sinai with a trumpet, the trumpet grew louder and louder. It reached a crescendo of power, and then God descended in glory. So too will Jesus be revealed from heaven as a divine heavenly shofar. Trumpet blows. The voice of God will penetrate the earth's atmosphere through the sound of that trumpet. And Jesus will be revealed and everyone will see him. For the creator of the world will reveal himself to his creation once again. Woo! Is that exciting? Yeah, y'all shout me down. Okay. <laughs> it's a reminder of God's presence upon the earth and a foreshadowing of the return of Jesus in much the same way. Oops, did I go past that? Oh, this is a picture. I skipped that, didn't I? This is a picture of the return of Jesus. This is why the book of Thessalonians tells us in chapter 4 that the Lord Jesus will descend again from heaven with the voice of the angel and the trump of God just as God descended on Mount Sinai with a trumpet. He's coming, you guys. He's coming. So, all right. Here we go. So what, signif so what significant things can we glean from this text as believers in the Messiah? Number one. Though Jesus has made the sacrifice on the mercy seat as both the Lamb of God and the high priest, we have to participate in our redemption. You participate in your redemption. How do you participate in your redemption? 
you have to receive what he's done for you, right? We can't just assume that because he did this, and yes, he did, he died once and for all to forgive all sins, that you just can't assume that it's going to apply to you until you receive it, until you accept the work that he did on the cross. Does that make sense? Am I losing anybody? Shout out if I'm losing you. Okay. Uh, be there. To receive it, we need to humble ourselves and repent of our sins. Understand, Jesus died once for all sin. However, we need to walk in such a way as we do not hinder the work or grieve the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because if we do hinder the work, we need, to hum we need to humble ourselves before God and ask him to forgive us of our sins, to be restored back to a healthy relationship. A lot of people teach, I love grace, and I know Pastor probably, he's probably going to have, we probably might have a little bit of a differing opinion, but understand what I'm saying here is this, you can grieve the Holy Spirit, and when you grieve the Holy Spirit, it can askew you out from what God is doing in your life. And you could be out here wandering a little bit, and you're thinking, Some, everything's not working. Why aren't things working for me? Why can't I hear God's voice? Why isn't God answering my prayers? What is going on? And then you realize, well, it ain't God. Because God didn't leave me or forsake me, so I must have taken the wrong turn in Albuquerque. Isn't that what Bugs Bunny used to say? <laughs> I took a wrong turn in Albuquerque, you know? And so you have to get back on track and say, Holy Spirit, God, just show me what I did, you know, so I can get back into right, restored relationships so that I am walking with you, so I do know you're hearing my prayers, and it feels like it, and I'm getting answers to prayers, and I'm seeing these things happen because now I'm back on track. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, it's just about getting back into restoration with the Father when we mess up, and we do mess up from time to time. Um, okay, <laughs> number two, Jesus is warning us to prepare for his return. Uh, in the above text, God gave the children of Israel three days to get ready for his arrival on the Mount, the, on Mount, uh, on the, t how did I write this? His arrival on the Mount Top of Sinai. Jesus warned us in the Gospels to always be watching and preparing for his return because he will come quickly and we will not know the day or the hour, but he will come like a thief in the night. And there's all of those Bible verses. You can check that out for yourself. We should always be prepared for his return to come like the five virgins who filled their lamp, right? That makes sense. Anybody have any, any conflict with that statement? So I know it's a little, understand, again, you're just trying to make sure that you're in sync with what God is doing in your life, okay? And I, you know, Bill Johnson says it like this. He says, when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove, and if, if you were to, let's say this Kleenex represents the Holy Spirit, in your life, and you walk in such a way that you honor the Holy Spirit in your life, and you're conscious of his presence here with you at all times. But if we do walk haphazardly, we can sort of just get out of sync with where he's going. He might be going this way, and we've taken a detour and we're over here, and he's over here, right? Does that make sense? Okay, all right, here we go. This is where we are right now, America's need of repentance. Having looked at the history of the Feast of Trumpets, let's look now at the relevance of the Feast of Trumpets this month as God sounds a warning blow from the heavenly trumpets to America. Today in America, we are at a crossroads. This nation is at a critical point in history. Never before have we seen the events in our nation that we are seeing right now. There is a blatant attack from the pit of hell against all godliness and morality. It is crucial that this year, we, the church, rise up from our slumber and actively engage in spiritual warfare. But before we do that, 
We have to humble ourselves and pray like we have never prayed before. As the body of Christ, the whole body of Christ, we need to come together and lift up our voice to heaven in an act of repentance for our nation. If we want to see our nation healed specifically from pestilence and plagues, we have to humble ourselves and pray for forgiveness for the atrocities that this nation has committed against its children from the womb to the selling of them in sex trafficking rings. If you want to know how God responds to a nation who sacrifices its children, read Jeremiah 19. Read Jeremiah chapter 19 and see what the Father says about the blood of the innocent. Last year, I talked to the Right to Life lady who was in here today, and I asked her again, I said, did you tell me 62 million? And she said, yes, they, that they know about 62 million babies lost their life in our country last year. And those are only the ones that are documented. 62 million babies. That is an atrocity. It is a horrible thing. We need to repent from all the horrific and horrendous acts committed on our soil under our watch. The key scripture used for the upcoming event is found in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And I'll wager that many of you can quote this, this verse. How many of you can quote this verse by heart without even looking at it? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, right? You can quote that scripture, right? Can you quote the one before it? Can't quote the one before it? I don't think so. Now this scripture was written by uh, when Solomon had just uh, built the temple, remember Jesus, or excuse me, the Ark of the Covenant was in the tabernacle, and then Solomon built a house, a real house, for the, for the Ark of the Covenant, a temple. And so he's prayed this prayer of dedication to the Lord, uh, inviting his presence to come and be in the temple. And then God responds to Solomon, and the, the part of this is what God says back to Solomon, and this is what he says. He says this, this is God speaking, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. See that? Or send a plague among my people. Hmm. <laughs> if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. We have a plague in America. Albeit it's more hype and fear on some parts, but there is a plague, and I think it's more a fear plague than it is an actual pandemic. America had a chance to repent after 9-11. You remember 9-11? How many know you know exactly where you were the day you saw the news and watched those planes hit the Twin Towers? I can tell you exactly where I was. And the United States Congress, the Senate, they all gathered outside and they all sang God bless America and they had a chance to repent. It didn't last. It got worse. It got worse because then we threw away the sanctity of marriage. And we said, no, it doesn't matter what the Bible says about marriage. We're just going to open it up to whoever wants to get married and not even one partner. You can have multiple partners and you can do whatever you want. And now in California, I put this on my Facebook page, but in California, the pedophiles there, I tell you, they want to be legitimized. They want to be legitimized for their pedophilia. And so they have pushed through a law in California asking for lighter sentences for having sex with children who are willing children. Can 
can a child actually stand up and say, no, I don't want to participate in this event? This is happening in our nation today. I'm not sure how many of you really know your Christian American history, but there was a Puritan pastor by the name of John Winth Withrop. Anybody know who he was? John Winthrop? You ever heard his name? You ever been to Massachusetts? There's a high school named after him. There's a, there's a bunch of things happening. He was uh, a Puritan pastor. In 1630, he sailed with his congregation on the Arabella ship. He sailed to the United States. And in the process, just as he's outside Massachusetts Bay, he preaches a message, a famous message called the City on the Hill. Ronald Reagan quoted from this, City on a Hill, right? You can go back and read this whole thing that he did. But Jonathan Winthrop, he prophesied this, and I'm going to, whoops, did I go? Here we go. I'm going to read part of what he was preaching in his message. He says this. Now again, he, they're about to land on the Americas and colonize the America for God. And he says, thus stands the cause between God and us. We are entered into covenant with him for this work. What's the work? The United States of America founding this new nation, a nation under God. We have taken out a commission, he says. The Lord hath given us leave to draw our own articles. And we have professed to enterprise these and those accounts upon these and those ends. We have hereupon besought him of favor and blessing. Now if the Lord shall please to hear us and bring us in peace to the place we desire, then hath the Lord ratified his covenant and sealed our commission. So he's saying, if God blesses this endeavor, we know that he's in it. That he's put a seal on this covenant with us for these United States. Well, they weren't called the United States then. <laughs> so, all right. Um, and we will, and will expect a strict performance of the articles contained in it. But, he says, if we shall neglect the observation of these articles, which are the ends we have propounded in, disassembling with our God, shall fail or fall to embrace the, this present world and prosecute our carnal intentions, seeking great things for ourselves and our posterity, the Lord will surely break out in wrath against us and be revenged of such a people and make us known the price of the breach of such a covenant. Then he goes on and he ends his message. Wait, did I go too far? Um, he ends it with Deuteronomy chapter 30 and he says, Beloved, there is now set before us life and death, good and evil, in that we are commanded this day to love the Lord our God and to love one another, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his ordinances and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied and that the Lord our God may bless us in the land whither we go to possess it. And then he prophesies this, but if our heart shall turn away, so that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasure and profits, and serve them. It is propounded unto us this day. We shall surely perish out of the good land whither we pass over this vast sea to possess it. This is a founding father of our nation, and he's prophesying, literally prophesying, the day you turn your back on God. The day we forsake him, he will, we will surely perish. Ugh, I know it's heavy, right? <laughs> here's, here's the crazy, I mean, it's not crazy. He prophesied this from the ship he was on sailing into the Massachusetts Bay as they were about to colonize it. This colony was founded on a peninsula close to the Logan International Airport, the very airport that the planes that were used in the terrorist attacks on 9-11 took off from. The very place that John Winthrop 
prophesied this prophecy is the very place that the airplanes took off on 9-11. Do you think that's a coincidence? You see that arrow right there? That's Winthrop Island. That's the Boston Logan International Airport. I don't believe this was a coincidence, but a fulfillment of Winthrop's prophecy and a warning from God. America, wake up. America, come back. America, I'm warning you, wake up. Jonathan Kahn uh, said this. He said, we have watched as our nation's culture has not only turned away from God, but now brazenly wars against him, his ways, and his people. How many of you guys have been watching what they've been doing to churches in some of these areas where there's rioting going on? Uh, statues are coming down. Church, a uh, Catholic priest was beat up. I mean, there's things happening. The, this movement is warring against the church. I mean, it's brazenly warring against the church. It is in the church's face going, what are you going to do about it? It has called you out. It has called us out. What are we going to do about it? God is calling us back to himself. As the Feast of Trumpets warns of the impending day of God's judgment, so too let those who have ears to hear the sound of the trumpet get right with God before the judgment comes. Jonathan says this, It is now the time of trumpets. We are standing at the most critical and dangerous hour. Will it bring calamity or redemption or both? Time will tell. But we must all pray as never before for repentance, return, and revival. The future depends on it. The return uh, focuses on five crucial acts that lead to God's redemption of the human condition, know, knowing that it is only the Holy Spirit who can lead persons to return to God. So this is what uh, this event on September 26, these are the credences that they are putting forth. So number one is repentance. It refers to a change of thinking and a renewing of the mind that produces a change of living. It's a turnaround of a sinful, self-centered way within us. Repentance is a 180 degree turn in our heart, in our mind, back to God. Reconciliation means change or exchange. Involves a change in the relationship between God and man or man and man. For true reconciliation, both parties acknowledge a break or offense has occurred. We must then forgive one another. Release it to God through Jesus Christ who is there interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. Restoration was in the heart of David praying for restoration and relationship to God in Psalms 51. This is a model prayer to be restored back to God. Revival is maintained by walking in the Spirit and being obedient to God's Word. Reformation in the church is crucial. And as we humble ourselves, pray and repent of our personal, national, and corporate sins, we will experience revival which will then usher in the favor of God to cleanse his church, the bride of Christ, as we invite him to return to us as we return to him. All right, so you can cut the, the video because I want to show you the promo for the event.